Good afternoon. My name is uh, Fazan Kadri, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute's Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and uh, thank you very much for attending today's program presented by the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff at College at Fort Leavenworth. A video of today's program will be available on our YouTube channel soon, and you can access the past videos of our program by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. A loop hearing system is available to use if you have a T-coil hearing aid. We also have a limited number of listening devices. Uh, if you have questions about the loop system or if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and a student worker with a microphone will approach you. Please stand if you are able to and ask just one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussions around important and often difficult topics. We will request you to phrase your questions by keeping these things in mind. And before we begin, I'd like to remind you to turn off your cell phones and any sort of technology. That'll be all from me, and now please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Jonathan Abel. Thank you very much. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. A uh, quick note before I introduce our speaker. So not next month, but next year, when we start the 2024 series in February, we're gonna be shifting the day so everything will be the same, except instead of the first Thursday of the month at 3, it'll be the first Wednesday of the month at 3. That's the only thing that's changing. Everything else is the same, just switching from Thursdays to Wednesdays. So we'll remind you of that a couple of times before then. So again, not next month, next year, we're going to start on Wednesdays. And, and we'll put that out through all the channels. You get all the information about this series. Uh, so Dr. John Hostler is uh, one of our rock stars in the department a prolific author and publisher on a variety of topics. As you can probably tell, he's our medievalist. Uh, he's a proud graduate of Iowa State University and the University of Delaware. Well, he's written many important uh, and interesting books, including on Henry II, King of England, on the Crusades, uh, the Siege of Acre. And he's doing some very exciting work on relics now. And so he's here today to talk to us about the early Muslim conquest of Syria. Dr. Hosler. In July, there was a sign, and that was stars that shot or moved about in the air, which some call falling stars. And they appeared every night in the sky, moving about quickly and rapidly the whole night, from the southern to the northern quarter, a thing never heard of before since the creation of the world. And the outcome of events showed that these shooting stars denoted the Arabs, who at this time entered the district of the north and slew and burnt and destroyed the district and all its inhabitants. That's a passage from a chronicle written by a fellow named Jacob, Jacob of Edessa, who was a Syrian Orthodox priest writing in the early 8th century. His image of the stars falling out of the sky and the Arabs coming north to invade and destroying everything they see is, I think, a really nice image to keep in your minds as we think about the topic for today. Falling stars... Um, celestial occurrences are not something that we necessarily anticipate. You look up in the, in the sky and all of a sudden they're there and everything is changing. And that was the response in the Middle East in the 7th century to these Arab attacks. They seemed to appear out of nowhere from a place no one had gone before and they struck everyone with surprise based on the speed of the invasions and the destruction that they wrought and all of the things that that destruction brought, which was the collapse of long-standing civilizations and empires. This is one of the more uh, important periods in all of history in terms of political change. It is a time in which two of the world's biggest and mightiest empires come crashing down within the space of just a couple of years of each other. And there is a mass movement of Arabs and the Islamic faith around the world of the old Roman Empire. Uh, so the early seventh century is a time of tremendous change. And what I wanna do today is walk through what exactly was going on in that period. Where did the Arabs come from? What are they fighting for? 
who are their opponents, what are the major muscle movements during this, um, these few years, and, um, and, and what the, the major issues are um, when we think about this period today, how it relates to us. And you see here on the map, it's a, it's a very large medieval Near East, and we're going to zoom in a little bit to center on, at the beginning, two areas that you're probably familiar with, modern-day Turkey and modern-day Iraq. The background to these Arab invasions has little to do with the Arabs themselves in the early stages. Uh, in the early 600s, uh, you have things going on in Arabia that are starting to bubble up, uh, but it's very much sort of a closed system at this point. The real news is coming out up north in the lands of the Byzantine Empire, the old Eastern Roman Empire, and the uh, Sassanid Empire of Persia. The Persians and the Byzantines could be considered the, uh, the two heavyweights in the world at this point. There really aren't polities around the world that can match them um, in terms of their economic uh, capabilities, uh, their armies, their political influence, their roles in the world. If you look around the rest of the world at this time, the major empires in India, uh, the, the, the Gupta Empire had fallen and had broken to a number of different um, uh, Confederate states. Um, you have in China a lot of turbulence uh, in a dynastic period and with there's, there's rapid political change over and over. And in Europe, uh, you have not yet arrived at the point of Charlemagne, so you're very much in the period of the barbarian kingdoms in Europe. It's a fractured world. There's not a lot of coherence there. So if you were to look around the world in the early 600s and say, who are the major players? It's these guys, uh, Persia and Byzantium. They are the ones. They are the major, uh, major forces. And they had been allies in the late 500s, but in the early 600s, they fall into war. And this has to do with a, um, a sordid murder uh, back in the Byzantine Empire of an emperor named by the name of Maurice. Maurice uh, is a very interesting individual who uh, purportedly wrote a treatise on military affairs. And he's murdered by a centurion by the name of Phocas. Uh, and this causes tremendous problems because Maurice was actually the son-in-law of the Persian monarch. The Persian monarch, his name is Chosro II. Um, he had married Maurice's daughter, Maria. And so when the centurion rises up and, and, and puts a knife into the Byzantine emperor, this causes some understandable friction with the Persian emperor, and he decides to invade. And that's what sparks the Byzantine Sassanid War. It begins in 602 with the murder of the emperor Maurice, and it rages back and forth. Right? The two heavyweight fighters going at each other. Now, during this war, Phocas himself is going to be uh, moved out, that's a nice gentle way of saying executed, moved out of the imperial throne in Constantinople and replaced by what was called the Exilarch of Africa, a very famous man named Heraclius. Heraclius is going to become the emperor of Byzantium and he's going to continue the war, which is interesting because you would think with the changeover and with the get, you know, getting rid of the, um, the murderous focus that things would have settled down, but they really don't and the war begins to expand. This is a war that has, I would say, in the last five, six years really come back into vogue. It's something that people didn't talk about for a long time, and now it seems that it's the, it's the center of a lot of chatter. There's two new books out on it this year, and, um, and I've talked to some, uh, some folks in the Army who are actually very interested in this uh, because of what this war represents. This is not a small little contest. This is what the, we would call today a peer-on-peer -peer war. Heraclius will maneuver no fewer than three field armies across Asia Minor and into Mesopotamia as he and the Persians are going to duke it out back and forth. This is very, very large-scale warfare. It's being fought in a number of different regions that are separated by mountains and, uh, and steep ravines. So you have armies operating independently of each other. And so today there's been a little bit of interest. I have a graduate student right now who's, who's poking around in these sorts of things. Uh, the Persians and the Byzantines are very much in vogue, which is great for me as a medievalist uh, because it means there's all kinds of great stuff coming out about these things. Right? Now, what does this have to do with the Arabs? Well, this is kind of a setup piece. During the course of this war, in the year 614, a Persian army arrives outside the gates of Jerusalem. It's an army led by one of Chosro's generals. He had just um, besieged the city of Caesarea on the coast, and now he moves to the holy city of Jerusalem. Uh, there is some negotiation, but after a period of time, the Persians break through the walls of Jerusalem and brutally sack the city, uh, killing thousands of people on the inside. And even more interestingly, once they're inside the city, they find their way to a very old church called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. 
the church that is built over the purported tomb of Jesus Christ. And they grab some monks and basically torture them into revealing the location of one of the holiest artifacts in Christian history, a piece of the true cross, a piece of the cross that Jesus supposedly died on, which the monks had been burying down below in anticipation of hiding it from the Persians when they came in. Unfortunately, the monks have to, they sort of have to give it up. They reveal the location of the cross. That cross is taken back to Setesphon, the capital of Persia, so it's spirited away. So now you've got another element to this story. It's not just wars back and forth. Now it's become a holy matter as well. And Heraclius, when he finally goes on his last offensives in the late 620s, finds his way very deep into Persia and forces in a peace treaty the Persians to give that relic back. What you see in the lower right-hand corner is a picture of Heraclius supposedly returning the cross to Jerusalem. Right? The day he returns the cross is celebrated in Orthodox and Christian liturgies to the present day. It's called the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross, and we just passed it. It was on September 14th, the date of its return. Right? So you have this Byzantine connection to the city uh, with the return of the Holy Relic, but there's another problem. The city has just been attacked and the walls have been breached by the Persians. So you have some work to do on the walls to protect your citizens the next time around. Unfortunately, Heraclius is a little short on money. Now, he doesn't quite have the cash. He has a little bit of cash, which we know he donated to the reconstruction of churches inside the city, as many of them had been destroyed by the Persians. So the churches are rebuilt, but as far as we know, he provided no money for the repair of the walls. And the tradition in the Byzantine frontier lands actually was for uh, local garrison commanders to do that work themselves, right? There's not going to be money coming from the capital to fix up your walls. You, you have to put the money in for that, right? Well, the walls were never rebuilt after the siege. So you would imagine when the next army comes to Jerusalem, it's not going to be all that difficult to get through the walls. There's literally a big breach in probably the northern sector of the city. Right? So that's the backdrop to this. Heraclius comes back to the city. He saved the holy relic, uh, but he hasn't done much to provide for the upkeep of the city. Right? And that's going to be a key issue when the Arabs do start coming across the border. And so here they are. When we talk about the Arabs in this period, and I, I like to term, use the term Arabs instead of Muslims because I, I think it more accurately captures what's going on at the period. You're talking about an ethnic tribe that is going to be marching to yet another war in the 630s. They have already been fighting wars down in Arabia. And those of you who know the story of Muhammad will find this a pretty familiar tale. Muhammad has to leave his home city of Mecca. He has to flee. He builds an army in the city of what becomes known as Medina. And there's a war fought between the cities of Mecca and Medina for almost 10 years. Right? Muhammad triumphs in that war. He marches back to Mecca in, um, you know, as, as a victor and reclaims his old city. The people who fought with him, otherwise known as the companions of Muhammad, are all going to play prominent military roles later on. They get their experience. They cut their teeth in the uh, inter-Arab wars that are going on. That brings a little bit of the Bedouin community in as well. And they are combat experienced by the time of Muhammad's death. Muhammad dies in 632. When he leaves... Much of Arabia has been converted to the Islamic religion, and there are tens of thousands of warriors down there sort of waiting for the next action. But with the prophet gone, you have to figure out who's going to be in charge of the soldiers, and that's going to fall to some of the closest companions of Muhammad. They're known as the Rashidun, as the, uh, the, the translation is rightly guided. The rightly guided caliphs, or successors to Muhammad. And I have them there on the, on the uh, slide for you. Uh, the first one, Abu Bakr, um, who is um, ex extremely close to Muhammad, but all of the other ones are as well. Uh, Umar, who we'll, we'll mostly talk about today. Utham, who everyone agrees is basically a colossal disaster. And then Ali, who is Muhammad's um, son-in-law and is, um, whose reign is going to cause sort of assorted problems by the time he dies. So those are the rightly guided uh, caliphs. They are going to continue military operations. There is virtually no break in the fighting. At the time of Muhammad's death, his armies are engaged 
in warfare. They had fought a battle against the Byzantines at the Battle of Muta in 629, three years before he died. And Muhammad was looking for payback against the Byzantine Empire all the way up until his death. And so there's sort of a, a mission there already. We have to go and deal with these Byzantine, uh, this Byzantine problem. But Persia is going to get swept into this a little bit as well because Byzantium and Persia are fighting a war against each other. And as they collectively lose soldiers and see their own fortresses weakened, there's going to be some opportunity regarding Persia as well. It's going to expend its combat energy and make, it a little, make itself a little weaker. Right? And the Arabs are going to be able to take advantage of that. Now, before you can attack Byzantium, before you can deal with Persia, you have to make sure your own house is in order. And this is going to fall to the first caliph, Abu Bakr. Right? Abu Bakr would like to move into Syria. He would like to move towards Persia, but he's got some problems in Arabia first. And as you see on the right, he's involved in a, in a, in a war that's known as the Ridda Wars, or sometimes called the Wars of Apasti. Um, the idea that there are some Arabs and some Bedouins in Arabia who refuse to convert to Islam and who refuse to come under the sway of the caliphate. These need to be dealt with first before you go on, on foreign adventures. So Abu Bakr spends his time between 632 and 633 dealing with these other Arabic tribes that are refusing to come under his rule. Right? Once the Ritter Wars are wrapped up in 633, now you can start looking outside. Right? Now you can start looking in other places. Abu Bakr never really gets to do it though. He dies only two years after Muhammad in the year 634. It's a, um, quite a surprise when he dies, um, but fortunately he had sort of handpicked a successor before he left. And that is the gentleman who goes by the name of Umar, Umar ibn al-Khattab, who is, I would argue, one of the most important figures in all of Islamic history. Uh, he's, he's, he, does, he, he brings about that, many, that much change as, as you'll see as we go through the, uh, through the talk here. Umar is going to be the person to run the foreign wars into into Syria and into Persia. Right? Umar is an interesting character. He is a military leader. He has experience in the, um, in the wars, uh, in, in the Ridda Wars, as well as the wars with Mecca. He is a messianic figure as well in an interesting way. Not that Umar himself has anything connected to uh, the last days, the apocalypse at the end, but Umar seemed to believe very strongly that the last days were upon the region. As he moves through Syria, he actually questions various people about apocryphal, uh, uh, apocalyptic scenarios, um, and he seems very interested in this. Now, that has thrown Islamic scholarship into a bit of a tiffle over the last 10 years or so. Um, the main idea that in the scholarship before was that when you read a book like the Quran, the Quran is all about submission. It's all about God and what humans ought to do for God. There's been a new trend in arguing that there's an awful lot of apocalypticism in the Quran as well that hasn't really been talked about very much, in which you have these expectations that the end of the world could be coming very soon. Umar seems to buy into this notion that the end times are, are nearly upon them. Um, not only is he um, going to ask questions about the, the end of days, but he's also going to, um, at first, not even believe um, when certain things occur. When Muhammad dies, for example, he doesn't believe it. He doesn't think it was possible. He thought Muhammad would be the one to carry Islam into the, uh, into the end times, and um, he has to be convinced and, uh, and, and shown the body before he'll believe that Muhammad's actually gone. Now, why do I talk about apocalypticism? Well, when the Arabs march into Syria, they're moving towards a city uh, called Jerusalem. And Jerusalem holds a critical place in Muslim end time scenario. And we have to understand Umar according to that. It's not just a military campaign. It has something to do with the end of days with what we call eschatology, last things. And so we want to remember that as we think about Umar. This is a military quest. It is a holy quest as well. So where do the Arabs go first? The wars actually begin at roughly the same time. Now, most of the concerted military efforts, if you want to talk about formal battles and attacks on cities, actually occur in Persia first. What's going on during those attacks in Persia, and you can see the list in 633 of the places that are um, being attacked by the Arabs, 
Back in Syria, it's mostly a lot of raiding. At, at first, it's kind of small-scale banditry, and then more concerted attacks upon population centers, um, and trying to trying to um, uh, take food and and money and resources, and con causing kind of general havoc. But the formal activity is actually going on a little further to the east in Mesopotamia. Right? And that is really where, when we think about Sassanid Iran, um, it's really not, it's, it's part of what we think of Iran as well, but it, you also have to include modern day Iraq as part of that. It's, it's a much bigger blob of territory. And so the wars will um, essentially cut up through the south of Iraq and march towards Setesfan, the capital, which is very close to modern day Baghdad. Right? So there's a series of battles that are fought there, uh, including the siege of Al Anbar, which would be uh, you know, um, recognizable to people of more recent experience. Um, and things are going reasonably well. The Arabs really aren't losing any battles. They are overwhelmingly successful, and even the setbacks they're, they're running into are, are not catastrophic. Uh, the, the march there is, is pretty clear, but in the middle of it, at the start of 634, the great conqueror who's leading the Persian effort, Khalid ibn al-Walid, is requested to leave. Umar has him leave the territory and shift over to Syria. Okay. A word about Khalid ibn al-Walid. We talk a lot at CGSC about great commanders and who is the greatest general of all time. And people will say it's Napoleon, it's Alexander the Great. And I would say they really have nothing on this guy. Khalid ibn al-Walid um, is a, sort of an obscure figure in Western um, senses of history. But in the Middle East, he is very well known. His nickname is the Sword of Islam, and he supposedly won over 100 battles. It's a, a record that you would you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone who, um, who, who has this kind of track record of success. Unfortunately, our details about a lot of those battles are very, very scarce. One sentence, two sentence, and assorted um, chronicles and letters. Not a lot to chew on, not a lot to go on. But he's clearly leading a very successful campaign until he is pulled away. And the idea is the Persian campaign can wait. Khalid, we need you over here in Syria because that's been dubbed much more important. Right. Why is it more important? Well, I would say Jerusalem has part to do with that, but also it's what the Byzantines have been up to. They have been garrisoning their frontier towns. They do look like they are trying to bulk up for an invasion, but there's also the personal bits. The Byzantines had personally offended the caliphate. We actually have copies of letters between um, Medina and uh, Constantinople in which there are various demands being met and various insults being thrown back and forth. At one point, uh, the caliphate actually demands that everyone in Byzantium convert to Islam and turn over all of their lands immediately, like right now. The Byzantines essentially laugh at them. You know, we're the Roman Empire. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, if you want it, come and get it. So Umar is going to make the decision that, you know what, I think we want it. I think we want it. I think we're going to move forward. So Khalid ibn Walid leaves Mesopotamia and he treks across the land and goes into the Levant and Syria instead, where you see a whole new series of attacks. And these steadily gain in size and prominence as time goes on. And once again, just like in Persia, large record of success. Virtually everything the Arabs into, you know, enter into, they're going to be successful. They're going to drive off Byzantine, um, small Byzantine forces. They're going to attack the city of Basra and take it. They'll attack the city of Damascus and take it by the end of 634. And that accomplishment is a, is a, we don't want to underestimate that, right? Damascus is one of the largest cities in the region. It has huge walls around it. It had been attacked several times in the past, uh, but this time it falls. And you have to remember who these cities are falling to. It is true that the Arabs have a very large army and they're very combat experienced. But to the Byzantine eyes, what do these fellows look like? They don't look like much. They're coming in from the desert sand. They're riding camels. Some of them have horses. You don't know their names. They're not famous. There's a huge uh, underestimation of the Arabs that goes on here, right? So over and over again, the Byzantines are, are sort of punked by these guys, right? The Arabs are winning over and over and over. And as they do, the propaganda is increasing, or at least that's what it seems like from the later Arab sources. Uh, you're getting revenge for past insults. You're getting revenge for the Battle of Mutah in 629, which was seen as an embarrassment to Muhammad. And now you're kind of paying that back. So that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Right? Persia, the idea is we can sort of put it on the back burner for a while. It looks like at the moment Byzantium is strong. And the reason for that is because Byzantium had triumphed in the Sassanid-Byzantine War, right? They're the winners. 
the emperor of Persia, Chosro II, he is executed by his own people. And once he dies, there are literally not one, not two, not three, but 10 successors within a year's period, right? So people rise up to take control of Persia and they're assassinated by their rivals and you have a new emperor and they're assassinated by their rivals. So what we're talking about is mass political instability here. Lately, there's been an argument saying that the Persians had also withdrawn from a treaty. They had been in some kind of military confederation with the Parthians and they decided to sever that connection. So from first Abu Bakr's point of view and then Umar's point of view, if you look at Persia, you say that place is collapsing around itself. It has no political stability. Its armies are weaker. We were already kicking their butt when they were good, and now they're not so good. Persia can wait, right? They're the easy one. Save them for later. The tough nut to crack is the Levant and Syria. And so that's where they're going to send their forces. And Khalid ibn al-Walid will be only one part of that uh, story. There are several other companions of Muhammad who are also well-accomplished soldiers and officers, and they're going to take part in this as well. So throughout 634 and into 635, you are going to see a lot of raiding and attacks on cities. As they mount in severity, the emperor of Byzantium, Heraclius, he knows there's a threat there and he decides he has to do something about it. It's not that Jerusalem and these frontier towns in the Levant are worth a ton of money. That's not what it's about. If you look at Jerusalem at this time, the population is probably maybe 15,000 people. It's very small, right? The other cities are larger, but this is not the economic engine of Byzantium. What is the economic engine of Byzantium is what lies around the corner, and that's Egypt. So there is a worry here that if the Arabs manage to penetrate into Syria and establish a foothold, they could swing to the west, move into Africa, and attack the Nile system. That, now you're talking real money. That is a real problem. So you have to seal up your Syrian frontier. Now, to do that, Heraclius is going to send um, armies forward. And you see here um, the, the commanders of this Byzantine force. The overall commander seems to have been this gentleman by the name of Vahan. That's all we know of his name. He's going to be leading a regional coalition of forces. What Heraclius will do is he'll strip the garrisons from the various Byzantine towns and cobble those Byzantine soldiers along with some other allies, Bedouins, Armenians, Basically, anyone he can find to scrape together into a fighting force. That's the regional force. And then there's going to be the proper Byzantine army, an expeditionary force sent forward from Constantinople. That's going to be led by the Byzantine treasurer, treasurer Theodore. Right? Theodore had seen battle before. He's not exactly the greatest of generals, but you know, in a pinch, you go with what you have. Right? So you have two Byzantine armies. You have an expeditionary force, and I would consider that that's the professional standing army of the Byzantine Empire. And then you have this regional force with extra manpower that Vahan's going to bring together. And you have a third ally as well, the Ghassanids, led by their king, Jabala. Now, the Ghassanids, these are Arabs uh, who, are, um, who have refused to convert to Islam. Right? So they're Arab allies, and that means that this war is going to be partially Arabs fighting other Arabs. Right? So it's an interesting um, ethnic dimension here. All these forces are going to start moving steadily southward. Intelligence has picked up that they're coming, and so Umar is going to respond with his own force sent into Syria. And you can see the uh, Arabic commanders there. Those are the four principal commanders that we like to talk about. Ubaya is the man in charge. He's going to um, not only gain victory at this battle, but also at Jerusalem. You see Khalid ibn al-Walid as well. You have Hashim, who is the commander of the infantry. And Amar ibn al-As, who is going to do very well in Syria, but he becomes much more famous later on because Amr is going to conquer Egypt. He's going to be the man who brings Egypt down in 646. Right? So this is a very accomplished group of people. And all of these armies will come together at a place called Yarmouk, which is just to the south and east of the Sea of Galilee. You can actually see it on the site on a clear day from Galilee. This is a six-day battle. This is not something that happens where you just bring forces together and all of a sudden uh, that they have this, this fight and it's all decided in a single day. No, it, it's going to take much longer than that. Uh, and you see from the geography, it's kind of an interesting landscape. You have what are known as wadis there um, running in that sort of forked fashion. Those are very, very steep ravines. You cannot ride horses up and down them. They're very steep, they're very rocky. And the armies are gonna gauge there in the center of them. There's one path 
to get across the Wadi you see there to the west to that square, which is the Byzantine camp. There's one bridge. Right? So if you look at the Byzantines who are in blue, they're in sort of a precarious position here. They've got their backs to a ravine, and they've got an Islamic force in front of them, and there's really nowhere to go, no way to get out of this. And you see as over time what happens, they strive back and forth, very slowly, the Byzantines are driven back, and you can see who popped in right behind the Byzantine army. You see that cavalry force of the Arabs. And what have they done? They have moved their horses around the back and occupied the only crossing across this ravine. So the Byzantines are stuck. At the end of day six, they're trapped between a steep ravine and this, um, this Arabic army, and it becomes essentially a killing field. Uh, from what we know of the accounts, no quarter is given whatsoever. There are individual stories of Byzantine, um, some of their officers, sitting down on the ground cross-legged, throwing their weapons out to the side, putting their hands up, and their heads are cut off just the same. No prisoners are taken from this battle. The Byzantines that do manage to get away flee towards the ravine, only to discover that the bridge is occupied. And so they do what really is the only course at this point. They try to ride their horses down the ravine. Uh, and so you can imagine this. The horses are falling. The people are falling. You just have this cobbling of people plunging down to their deaths. The entire force is wiped out. The few stragglers that get along the, um, the, the flank and manage to surrender, um, or, or manage not to surrender, but manage to escape, race to the north looking for safety. If you're Emperor Heraclius, this is the worst news you could possibly get. Not one, but two armies have been completely destroyed. And remember, he had an expeditionary force, but he had that regional army. And where did all those extra soldiers come from? He stripped the garrisons of all his frontier towns. So now your lands in the Levant and Syria, you have no major army to protect them. And most of the cities no longer have a garrison. They're surrounded by walls. But how long are those walls going to keep the Arabs out? Not too long, right? This is where the title of the talk comes in. Supposedly, Heraclius, who is not on the scene, but who is further north, he's not in Constantinople, he's actually with, within um, a riding distance of this. He hears about the disaster at the Battle of Yarmouk, and according to later stories, he looks at the ground, he looks up at the sky, and he bids Syria adieu. Goodbye. Right? And if you look at the, my wife uh, called attention to this on to me this morning. If you look at the French meaning of adieu, it's not only goodbye, but it is to God. So I will see you again, Syria, only in the afterlife. Right? He gives up on it. Now, before he leaves and goes back to Constantinople, he sends messages to his garrisons and says, look, do what you can, right? Grab the soldiers you can. Here's, you know, grab some weapons. I give you permission to go to the armories and arm yourself, but uh, you know, good luck. I'm rooting for you, and I'm going back to my capital. He writes Syria off. You might as well. The writing is on the wall. He knows exactly what's going to happen. With no field army to um, save Jerusalem, the city is, is, um, is mincemeat. And I would point out, if you look in the future to um, the more sieges of Jerusalem that are going to come through the centuries, just in the Middle Ages, there's 20 of them. In every single event, when Jerusalem does not have an army to protect it, it falls. And you can carry that all the way into the 20th century. All right. You, you need an army to protect this city. So the Battle of Yarmouk is a horrific moment for the Byzantines, but it is a watershed moment for the Arabs. That battle is still celebrated to this day. Yarmouk is considered one of the great moments. It ranks up there with Muhammad's retaking of Mecca and Saladin's liberation of Jerusalem in 1187. It is one of those great moments. And for orchestrating all of this, the Caliph Umar is celebrated as one of the great champions of Islam. And once again, when you talk about great Islamic conquerors, there are three names that are always at the top. It is Muhammad, Saladin, and Umar. Those are the top guys. Umar and Saladin are routinely compared to each other as the great champions. So what does Umar do now? The Byzantine field army is gone. He just has to move on Jerusalem. Remember, as we said, the walls of Jerusalem, which had been breached, had never been repaired. You don't have to worry about Byzantines coming to its aid, so you bring your force to the city, you set up a siege, and you wait. The garrison inside, small as it is, and the patriarch who is manning the defense, they know they are weak. They do what they can. They shoot, shoot off a few showers of arrows. They charge from the gate a couple times. They're beaten back instantly. They have no ability to hold this city, and the patriarch knows it. You have to surrender. 
you have to surrender or everyone inside is going to die. The rules of engagement throughout the Middle Ages are if you want to negotiate, then you can save the lives of the people inside. If you negotiate a good surrender, um, quarter will be given and arrangements can be made. But if you decide no negotiation, once the army breaks through that wall, all bets are off. All bets are off. So he knows, the patriarch, that the citizens will be, um, will be raped and murdered. That's what happens in sacks of cities. The whole city will be despoiled. And he's a little worried about that because, remember, it's not just any city. It's the city of Jerusalem. It has a piece of the true cross inside of it. It has the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It has where Jesus was put on trial, where he walked to his death and the spot of his resurrection. So this is not a city you can just let someone else have. So you see Umar there looking at the city the second rightly guided caliph, he's going to make a deal with the patriarch. And the deal is known as Umar's assurance. They strike up a contract, which essentially says, the Arabs get the city. We're, we're the conquerors, we get the spoils. But the Christians can stay here, they can keep their houses, they can keep their properties, and they can continue worshiping in their churches. The Muslims, however, get the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is going to go to Islam, and there will be no Christians up there praying. And at the time, the patriarch says, that sounds like a really good deal because the Temple Mount's being used as a garbage dump. Christians don't really care about the Temple Mount at this period. It holds very little significance to them. Yeah, maybe Jesus wandered around up there and drove people out of the temple, but the real holy spots for Christianity in this period is the spot of Jesus's um, trial, crucifixion, um, burial, resurrection. That's the, those are the parts that matter, right? So he trades the Temple Mount for the rest of the city. That agreement forms the core of a long-standing agreement in the city of Jerusalem that is still in effect to this day. It's referred to as the status quo agreement. The idea that these Christian churches are able to operate, are able to uh, survive, and that there is religious liberty inside the town. Right. Bit of a footnote here. The patriarch also asks Umar for a favor when they work out this deal. He says, it's great that you're gonna give us our lands. We are so happy. Thank you for not killing us. Um, could you please make sure there's no Jews around? We don't want the Jews in the city. Can you throw the Jews out of the city as well? And Umar agrees. And so all the Jews in Jerusalem are tossed out of town, right? But it seems from um, some various sources that just a couple years after this, Umar actually brings the Jews back in. He actually invites them back into the city. He says, look, this isn't my beef with the Jews. I want them to come back into town. Okay. So within just a couple of years of Jerusalem's fall, you have a very inter interesting situation in Jerusalem. It's under Muslim ownership, but you have Christian and Jewish right to worship in the city, which is a strange thing to think about just a few years after the death of Muhammad, right? We typically don't think about religious plurality and diversity in this period, but that's exactly what you have. And for Umar, it's especially gratifying because if you look at the map of Jerusalem, now that he's got the Temple Mount, he also has this right here known as the Gate of Mercy, Today, it's referred to as the Golden Gate. This is where, for Islam, the end time scenario will kick in. It is where a person by the name of the Dajjal, the Antichrist, will be killed by the righteous, and there's a little building called the Dome of the Chain where the final judgment will take place. So for Umar, this is fantastic. He's got a city, his Byzantine army's uh, enemies have been destroyed, and he has the spot where he believes the apocalypse will take place. All right, so what a year, 638. This is a huge year for the Arabs, a huge year for Islam. He will commemorate this occasion by building the first mosque on the Temple Mount. Now, it falls down. It's a little bit like Monty Python. You build the first castle, right? And it sinks into the swamp and you build another one, it sinks into the swamp. Several iterations of this mosque known as Al-Aqsa will be built, uh, but it's Umar that gets that process started. And now when you go to the Temple Mount, you see the fruits of his labor, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the third most important mosque in Islam, and the Shrine of the Dome of the Rock with its beautiful golden top. Both of those are built in the century after Umar. And so it's really his agreement that allows for Islam to set a firm foothold in the city of Jerusalem. All right, that's what's going on in Jerusalem. What about those pesky Persians? Umar hasn't forgotten about them, right? We're gonna deal with them in due course as well. Now that Syria has essentially been taken care of because Heraclius has fled the scene, and I should note that um, after Jerusalem, a succession of Syrian cities just fall into the Arab hands. I mean, it's just like a waterfall. Just one by one, they all get washed away. Right? But now you do have to deal with the Persians. Fortunately, they are still um, politically incoherent. They still have fewer allies than they used to. And so now you can send your armies back over to Mesopotamia 
and start charging up the Tigris and Euphrates rivers once again. The end of the Persian story comes at this battle here in 636, Cadicia, which is a sort of ranks an important sort of right underneath Yarmouk because it, it's representative of the fall of Persia. This battle has elephants, which always makes it really cool. Now, you can see the little elephant units up, up there in front of the army, and as the uh, map progresses, you'll see them maneuvering around the battlefield. Again, a very long fight. It takes course over, over, over the place of several days. The Persians in blue have their backs to the water, and they're desperately trying to fend off the, um, the Rashidun army. And as you see here, it's got commanders that, that weren't there before, because the other commanders like Khalid, they're busy over in Syria. It's almost like the Arabs have this inexhaustible supply of brilliant military commanders. I don't think we recognize it as much as we should. There is so much talent in the Arab army. Over the course of several days, you see the striving back and forth, resetting the lines. Oh, there go the elephants. They're taking off, right? Their units are shattered. And gradually, as time goes on, the Persians are put on the back foot until you have the most cataclysmic event. Rostam, the commander of the army, gets beheaded um, during the battle. And once they lose their commander, that's it. You see the route is on. They break across the river. Um, the Arabs are, are chasing them. Right after the Battle of uh, Cadicia, they move to Setisfan. They take the capital of the Persian Empire. Okay. And after that, it's just a lot of consolidation of gains and sort of cleaning up. Right? But if you think about this, the Battle of Yarmouk happens in the summer of 636. al Cadicia happens in the fall of 636. This is one heck of a year. In the course of two seasons the Muslims have taken down the two most powerful armies in the world, right? That's pretty good for a bunch of guys coming out of the desert that nobody's ever heard of before. Very impressive uh, accomplishments. So the fall of two empires, the road is open to the rest of Mesopotamia, which will be occupied and eventually brought over to Islam. Syria, the Levant, will also be in time Islamicized, although that takes a lot longer than most people think. The initial Arab thrusts are not actually bent on conversion. They really are bent on military conquest and political occupation of territories. There's uh, several questions that pop up as they, are, um, as they are winning these territories about whether or not non-Arabs can even become Muslims. It's an intellectual question that nobody had thought of asking at first. Uh, you have some Byzantines who say, look, I, you know, I know I'm not Arab, but I'll, I'll jump in on this, um, this uh, Allah thing. And there's head scratching, like, it, was that allowed? Can we do that? And eventually, they're going to be welcomed in, but it takes a little bit of time. But here's why these conquests are even more important than just taking down of two empires. It's what comes after. You now have Islamic control of Jerusalem, Islamic control of Mesopotamia, Syria, and the Levant. But why stop there? You've got what seem to be the best armies in the world. I think probably every professor of medieval history has this map on one of their slide decks someplace. Right? This is the expansion of Islam in the period after the death of Muhammad. You can see that darkish red portion in Arabia. Those are Muhammad's conquests. That's up till 632. And I think that's a pretty big accomplishment in his days today. A lot of it is desert, right? But he is capturing the major uh, population centers uh, in the Hejaz in the western coast of Arabia. And then after that, you see the movements into Syria. There's the movements into Persia. By the time the 630s are done, all of Syria has been conquered. By the time you get to 646, all of Egypt is conquered, and the Arabs are pushing their way west into the African Maghreb. At the same time, they're pushing north into the rest of Persia. All of the rest of Persia will fall by the, uh, by the end of the 7th century. And then, of course, on the west, where else are they going? All the way across Africa to Morocco, across the Strait of Gibraltar, and into Spain. This is seen as the giant pincher movement of the Arabic forces. And as they're spreading here, they're no longer just Arabs. As they're winning converts, they're picking up different ethnic groups who are converting to Islam. So you have the Berbers in North Africa who are going to carry the fight there. You have other groups coming down from the Caucasus Mountains that will convert to Sunni Islam, and they'll push the war as well. Now, the reason why most historians have this on their slides is the implication of it. If the Arabs are curling up on one side into Central Asia, and if they are curling up the other side into Spain, where are they going next? If you are someone named uh, the Roman Pope, for example, and you're sitting in Rome, you're getting very, very worried looking at this map. Right? Are the Muslims coming for us? Now, 
some people have taken this a little too far. You'll frequently hear same people say, well, this is uh, you know, the, the doom of Christendom. It's about to fall because the Muslims would have pushed further. They would have ended the Christian faith. They would have destroyed everything. And frankly, I think that's, that's a, a little bit of nonsense, right? It's a more slippery slope than anything. Uh, but surely if you are a political leader sitting there in what we would call modern day France, a man some of you may have heard of by the name of Charles Martel, you are very concerned that the, uh, the Arabs are coming your direction and, um, and you need to put a stop to this, right? If you're in Constantinople, you're the Byzantine emperor, you're also worried. There are multiple attacks against Constantinople. The first one happens in the late 600s and then another one happens in the year 717. Both huge naval assaults against, uh, against the capital city of Byzantium. Those naval assaults are beaten back through part technological and, if you believe the sources, part miraculous means. The technological one is the advent of what we call Greek fire. And we have manuscript illuminations of the Greeks using Greek fire to set fire to the, uh, the ships coming up from Egypt. And then the other mighty weapon is another piece of that true cross. And there's a story in 717 where the emperor of Byzantium, Leo III, takes a piece of that cross and carries it to the water and slams it down into the Bosphorus at which point the waves start um, uh, cavorting back and forth and all of the Arab ships are, um, they cavitate and they, and they get sunk right on the spot. And then of course, as a poetic justice afterwards, the, uh, the Arabic admirals wash ashore and immediately prostrate in themselves in front of the church and uh, become Christians. Right? And we kind of look at that part of the story and we're like, yeah, that's, that's propaganda. Um, but the point here is that the Arabs are on the march and these other groups that convert to Islam are going to join them. This is a permanent change from the old world that went before. This is over half of the territory of the old Roman Empire. And it has fallen, you have to think about the speed of this. All of this is accomplished by the time you get to the, um, the end of the seventh century, right? So just a few decades the territory that the Romans took centuries to build, the Arabs grab over half of it in just a few decades. So I think when you th think about the attacks of six, the 630s, the conquests of Persia, the conquests of Syria, um, th the most useful way to think about it is more in the world historical context. It's not just localized fighting. It's not just a grudge match between an upstart dynasty and an, an old empire who doesn't think they have a place in the world. Uh, these are world historical events. They are permanently changing the landscape of the Mediterranean world. Islam will come to North Africa. It will never leave. Islam will come to the Near East. It will come to Iran. It never leaves. And there's going to be efforts in the successive centuries to throw them out. You'll see lots of crusades. You'll see lots of invasions. And they're all going to fail. So it really is the Arabic invasions of the 630s that set the context for a whole new world. Thank you. And if you like the series, this is coming up next from Dr. John Kuhn, who is in the audience tonight. Um, so if you're interested in Japan, uh, please consider coming back next month to hear about uh, Hideyoshi. Okay. And I'm happy to take any questions you have. Yes. Um, you briefly started to talk about technology. And I remember uh, some years ago on PBS, there was a, a series about how technological discoveries back then. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just naturally loud. Is this on? Can people hear me? Okay. Uh, what technological, what, what is the number one technological change that the Arab invasions brought that mm. stayed with uh, the civilizations that they conquered? Mathematics uh, is the one I always think about. Is their, their work in mathematics. Yeah, it's, it's a little tough to say in, in this period. Um, because when you talk about the sort of the flowering of Islamic arts and literature and mathematics and science, you have all of that, but it doesn't happen in the very early years. Uh, we tend to think more of that with uh, what's known as the Abbasid Caliphate later on, once you get to the 8th, 9th, and then especially 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries. Um, yeah, it was the golden era, right? Um, so this enables that to happen, but there is actually some lag time um, in between those things. And I... I don't know that we have a definite you know, reason for that, but the Islamic world, you look at the map and it, it looks like a unified push. 
very quickly it becomes heavily disunified, right? Uh, you have the assassination of Ali, the fourth caliph. You have the Sunni and Shia split, which essentially happens in the year 680. Um, you have the overthrowing of the Rashidun by a group of Syrians, um, the Umayyad Caliphate, who then get overthrown in 750 by the Iraqis. Um, and so there's, there's an awful lot of change. Um, and so at, at that point, it becomes harder to say, is this because of a, a concerted Muslim push of science and, and technology and these other things? Or is it more of a um, sort of a, more of a, a diverse push? Because if you look at these cities, there are Muslim converts and there are Arabs living in them, but you also have Jews and you also have Eastern Orthodox Christians. And oh, they're driving a lot of this innovation as well. So what I found in my research is, for example, if you talk about like law, for instance, you have in various cities, um, Muslim and Jewish law schools operating right next to each other. And they're actually in, 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 in discussions with each other. Yeah, and in medicine. And you have, um, you have some great movements forward on the Islamic side, but also on the Jewish side. And so to figure out what's going on, you kind of have to step back and say, okay, so who's talking to who? Who's alive when? Where do they go? Where is a book written? What library has it? What school is opened? Um, and that's kind of a more complicated story. But I would say what this does is it, it, it ushers in the possibility for those things. The question is, is would those things have happened without Islam? And I, I, don't, I don't know, I'm, I, I can't answer yay or nay on that. Uh, the Byzantines are very smart of their own accord. The Persians are doing amazing things. Um, and so when you get these periods of these sort of these renaissances, these golden ages, right? I tend to see them as kind of the, uh, the, the multicolored cloth, right? I mean, they're, they're so intricate and, and woven together. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit on the Arab logistics and their uh, skills in siege craft? Seem seemingly very successful. Yes. Um, so logistics first. You're talking at the early stages about landborne logistics. They don't have a fleet yet. They're going to build one very rapidly, um, taking things from Egypt and, and using those. Uh, but at, at the beginning, it's, it's really up the major trade route that comes up the Western Arabian coast. Um, they're making sure that their forward positions are supplied with enough uh, material to get it done. Um, we don't have a lot of, well, we don't have any quantitative data about how exactly they're doing that. One of the problems with everything I've told you today is that the earliest sources, uh, the primary sources for all of this stuff are not actually Arabic sources. They're Christian sources. They're Syriac, they're Armenian, um, and they frankly are on the receiving end and they're not looking very closely at what's being dragged where and what's being taken where. By the time you get to the, 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 the really good um, Islamic sources, historians like a like gentleman by the name of Al-Tabari, who's one of the most famous Muslim historians, um, he's providing some of that information, but it's so late, it's like 200 years later. So it's very difficult to re uh, recon reconstruct exactly how they're moving their forces. Siegecraft's a little better because the people on the receiving end know what's going on and they can see exactly what's happening. Uh, the, they tend to employ a lot of different methods for siegecraft. We know they use catapults. We know they, um, they do sapping. They will tunnel under walls. They use um, blackmail, uh, psychological te techniques. Um, one very interesting technique is to slip spies into the city and while you're attacking one wall, spread the rumor that the gate has fallen on the other side of the city so that the citizens lose hope and they say, oh, it's over, right? And then they abandon their positions. That's what happens at Damascus. You have one army in front of the gate and then you've got another army sowing confusion on the inside. So they're doing the physical and the psychological stuff in tandem very well. And I would say the other thing uh, is that they're very efficient in their siege craft. At Jerusalem, they know they don't need the most armies to take this city. They know it's weak. They know they can just post up outside of the gates and no one's getting in or out. And so they use not the bare minimum of soldiers, but just enough to get the job done so you can send your other forces places where they're needed. During the siege of Jerusalem, other city sieges are going on at the same time. No. Uh, first of all, I enjoyed your uh, presentation. Uh, you talk about uh, uh, campaigns and uh, battles, etc. Uh, but my question is uh, whether you have any idea of the actual uh, number of uh, troops engaged in these uh, in these uh, conflicts. Uh, you talk about three different theaters in the uh, in the uh, struggle between the uh, 
uh, Byzantines and the uh, Persians that you began your uh, talk with, but I just wondered if, if you knew how many actual troops were involved in those three different theaters. Uh, also, uh, Battle of Yarmouk, uh, Battle of uh, Cadesia, if you had any idea of what the actual scale of the forces was there. Yeah, hard questions to answer real hard. Um, early medieval military history is tough because the numbers are usually inflated. Um, they're usually written down much later and they're highly untrustworthy. Uh, so the only way to untangle them is to say, well, if a source says there were 50,000 people at the battle, is to do a kind of a contextual look and say, okay, well, how many people lived in that city? How many forces had been raised in earlier places? Do we know what the rough demographics are? Can we kind of put it together? Uh, what it seems to be, that the answers I've seen is that Yarmouk and, um, and Cadicia are probably being fought between 30 and 40,000 soldiers each, uh, which for the Middle Ages is massive. Right, th th that those are huge numbers for the Middle Ages. Um, the other encounters are going to have smaller forces because they're marching in separate armies and they're not always coalescing together. For Heraclius, uh, for his um, field armies in um, in Asia Minor, those seem to have been on that same scale. So you might have 25,000 over here, you might have 30,000. You could probably compare it to, I suppose, Napoleonic Corps, right? 20, 30,000 a piece moving. Um, but again, it's, it's very difficult. The Byzantine sources are better for those discussions, but again, there's, they're always presented in round numbers, and every time I see a round number, just the doubt flows right through my head. It's, it's way too convenient to give me an even 15,000, right? Because I know it wasn't, right? Um, so it's, it's tough, but the, the big engagements in this period, there are sizable forces there. Everything else is, is kind of a crapshoot. You may only have two, 3,000 soldiers outside of a city attacking it. Great question. I think we had one down here. Um, to some extent, although the Arabs are using um, horse archery to a great extent, but you can still see who you're shooting at. Yeah, absolutely. I hope so. It's actually, um, there are some good tidings right now. Um, one thing I'll point to is the renewed activity in Saudi Arabia, uh, where there's a lot more digging going on and pulling up old sites. The Saudi government has decided that there's some tourism to be found with, uh, with some of these things, and, and, they're, and they're allowing excavation to go forward. Um, it's still very fruitful in Israel. It's, it's, it's uh, reasonable in Jordan. Syria is the big problem, and then I would say also Iran. Um, you're, you're just not going to get into those places to do serious digs right now. A lot of the uh, great remains in Syria were damaged by the Civil War and have not yet been repaired. So I'm optimistic on the more southern end, more optimistic than, than further up north. Yeah, uh, But, but it, it's, it's tough, and I have colleagues who, who, who dig actively over there, and they, they want to get into these places, but untangling the politics of it is really, really hard. Uh, so we can, we can hope for the best. I, I think there's decent signs on the horizon. That's a very general answer to your question, but that's, that's how I see it right now. Yeah. Tom? Uh, I have another question. Uh, this is a larger question. Uh, you described this uh, explosive growth of, of uh, Arabian uh, influence and dominance uh, in the Near East of uh, 1632 to 1711, or 711, mm -hmm. um, 80 years, just 80 years, this explosive, explosive growth in their power. And uh, uh, there are a couple of other cases of this happening. Uh, Alexander's uh, empire happened suddenly, and uh, Genghis Khan's uh, empire is put together suddenly, so it's not the only case. Uh, and, and you describe this as uh, the, the, the uh, Byzantines looking at this and saying it's like shooting stars, uh, huge and inexplicable and magical. But my question to you is, if you had to explain it, how would you? I think you can't explain it without talking about the religious fervor of early Islam. Um, this is a missionary faith. It is um, designed um, in, its, in its origins to be spread and to bring more believers under the Dar al-Islam, under the abode, right? To bring more submission to Allah. And I think without that, you don't have um, the urgency 
of these, um, of these wars. I, th I think that's, that's a, a huge contributor to it. Uh, and the other thing I would say is, if you compare it to, yes, there have been many other great conquests in time, right, um, that have left certain legacies. Uh, but I would argue that these conquests have left much firmer legacies than the Mongols, easily. I think that's not even a contest. I think Alexander the Great, in terms of uh, we refer to as Hellenization and the spreading of Greek culture, there is definitely something there. But I think Alexander left a part of Greek culture. He left language in some places. I mean, we have like Hindi coins with Greek on one side and Hindi on the other, right? Um, there is a lot of Greek culture that was spread. Here you are talking about wholesale cultural change in some of these places. Not 100% because you still have Jews and you still have Christians and they keep their religions and these sorts of things. But in terms of bringing um, culture from Arabia to other parts, uh, it is so long lasting. And I think that's what distinguishes it uh, because they, you know, Alexander the Great leaves. You know, he, you know, he goes back to uh, Babylon and dies and the Mongols leave. They get chased out. The Mamluks beat them. They have to beat a hasty retreat. They get beat in China. Um, nobody beats Islam in these regions. They stick around for a long time. And I think we're at the end. So thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it.